uh, my good call this week, uh, I forgot to wear it on the last show, but I did get this lovely Christmas gift. It says, toy, 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 y'all, uh, from the Atlanta <laughs> Opera. And if that ain't me, I don't know what is. On the Dallas Opera Network, you're listening to Opera Box Score. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Wherever you are, However you are listening, it is America's Talk radio show about opera. It is Opera Box Score. I'm George Cedarquist, joined this week by Oliver Camacho, Matt Cummings, and Weston Williams. All right, this week, the Australian Open kicks off, and in the early rounds, a lot of Australian qualifiers will be eliminated. The OBS brings back its brutal TKO segment and offers you an all-Australian matchup. Plus two minute drill. Mozart's birthday is coming up and his gayest opera is getting funding. If you're watching on TDO, you want to make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get the full show. Stitcher, Spotify, you click follow. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, smash that plus sign in. You can even just ask Alexa to play Opera Box Score if that doesn't freak you out, which it would me. <laughs> Email us your hot takes, operaboxscore at gmail.com. Drop us a line. Send us a voice memo if you want to get your voice on this show. You do that, you get an OBS beer coaster, and you get an OBS lapel pin just for sharing your own hot take. So much sports happening at this time of year. I love it. Oliver, we're going to go straight to you and only you. Give us 30 <laughs> seconds on Djokovic and what is going on in Australia. I mean, this is the most overreported story in tennis history. I mean, I've heard it on every news outlet, uh, even NPR talking about this scandal of Djokovic entering the country, Australia, unvaccinated, with a medical exemption from the tournament, but the country, not the immigration, not accepting his exemption. So quarantining him or um, locking him basically up in his hotel room, away from his team, and the court eventually ruled that he will be deported. So he does not get a chance to compete in this year's tournament and maybe not come back for three years. I don't know how this is going to mm. result in, but he always wins the Australian Open. He won it mm. nine times already. Yeah, This is the weirdest tournament because like nobody really is ready to play the Australian Open. It's like too early in the season. And he somehow always is just in such good form. And so he clearly would have won <laughs> this year had he yeah. been able to compete and he would have become what some people think the greatest of all time because he would have achieved 21 grand slams. Right now he's in a tie with Rafael Nadal yeah. and uh, Roger Federer. So this would have been the tournament where he broke the tie. Wow. No 10 yeah. Pete today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was extremely succinct. Thank you for bringing us up to speed. We are going to get right to it. Let us talk some opera. TKO on the OBS. So everybody knows how much I love tennis. And to me, it's the biggest event for the week of January 16th, January 17th. I know there's some football stuff coming up soon. Uh, but right now, it's all about tennis. And there's going to be Olympics coming up in yeah, less than a month now. It's true. Um, so the Australian Open, like many other Grand Slams, uh, the host country always ends up with a lot of qualifiers coming through in the early rounds. And so we're going to see a bunch of Australians knocking each other out uh, in, the, in the first and second <laughs> rounds. Uh, so we thought, why not do an all Australian TKO? And obviously, when you think Australian singer, the first place your mind goes to is Joan Sutherland. And or if you're old be... school, it's Nellie Melba. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be real. Joan Sutherland is the Serena Williams of opera. And, well, uh, I think she's more the Djokovic because she's not participating in this in this round. <laughs> she's so, not an anti-vaxxer. How dare you? <laughs> there's no reason for us to pit Joan Sutherland against any other of her compatriots. I think the next name that comes to mind, besides Nellie Melba, uh, would be Danielle Denise. And, you know, mm. based on her charisma and her sort of groundbreaking career, um, I think she would go pretty far. Also in a tournament. So wait a second. Don't forget Kiri Tick. Actually, never mind. Yes. Uh, <laughs> different country. Nice try. 
So um, we decided between Matt and I that we were going to go with two singers, one who I think you should know, and one who is up and coming and probably will be on everybody's lips very soon. Uh, I'll start off by uh, introducing Yvonne Kenny, uh, one of my favorite, actually, recitalists, a really fantastic uh, song, interpreter of song. But uh, Yvonne Kenny became an overnight star in 1975 when she sang uh, on four days' notice the title role of Rosmonda Dingditera, an opera everybody knows <laughs> by Donizetti. <laughs> She's saying that whenever I'm in the shower, I go directly to an aria from the from whatever it was you just said. You know what that is? That's Joan Sutherland repertoire. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Renee Fleming repertoire, too. Um, So she sang this role in four days notice and it shot her to international stardom as a Rosamund the Dingletero would. And she went on to sing many roles, uh, especially in the Handelian repertoire and Mozartian repertoire. Uh, She also eventually essayed the role of Melisande and Pelias and Melisande and Manon uh, and other French roles like Leila and Pearlfishers and Michaela. Um, and then later on in her career, she became a noted Marshallin. And there's a fantastic set of her singing the Marshallin from English National Opera in the English translation. And that was actually one of my first recordings mm-hmm. of Marshallin because I, I, it was hard for me to get into Strauss. I've always had a very small brain and now I, I'm a full on <laughs> Strauss person. But early on, I actually needed to hear it in English to figure out what the heck is going on in this opera. Uh, But as I said, she is a fantastic recitalist. You can find some of her recitals from Wigmore Hall. Um, Beautiful voice, clearly meant to sing Mozart for its intonation and for its lean vibrato and for its clear enunciation of text. And later on in her career, the voice took on an edge and became more uh, silvery and was able to essay these more dramatic roles for the type of singer she is, such as the Marshallin. So that is in one corner of the TKO, yes. Yes. the five-round TKO. So, Matt, who Yvonne is in your Kenny. corner? Yvonne Kenny is going to be going up against Nicole Carr, or Nicole mm. Carr, probably. Uh, she's an up-and-coming ah. Australian <laughs> lyric soprano, as, a, as Oliver said. Uh, she really has been making a number of notable debuts over the last 10 to 15 years. I think she's been active in her career for maybe 13 years at this point. Her U.S. debut was in the role of the Contessa. Her Met debut was in the role of Mimi. So a little bit juicier of a voice we're talking about. More mm-hmm. of like a Kiri Takanawa, Renee Fleming type of Mozart singer than uh, than a Handelian. Uh, she actually returned to the Met in 2020. You heard that right, not a mistake. Uh, to sing a couple, to sing some performances of Fiordaligi just before everything was shut down for COVID. She's mm. been hailed for her warm tone, her sensitive singing, her winning stage presence uh, in roles like Mimi, Marguerite, and Faust, Ellen Orford, and Peter Grimes, Tatiana, Don Elvira, and of course Fiordaligi. Uh, her biggest credit to date probably is the winner of the Neue Stimmen competition in uh, 2013, the German singing contest, with, uh, where she shared the winning title with Nadine Sierra. So that is the yeah. kind of generation of singers that we're talking about here. And she's famously married to Etienne Dupuis, the baritone, and they appear together in the Met at Home Gala. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, she, and they were supposed to appear together... Uh, in Santa Fe Opera's production of um, Eugene Onegin, uh, but they couldn't get a visa. And so um, Lucas Meacham replaced Etienne Dupuis and Sarah Jubik-Kayak replaced Nicole Carr in that production that I saw. Shout out to Santa Fe Opera. So wait, they, they fell the same fate as Djokovic? Were they then like expelled from the country? Because <laughs> they didn't have visa? They're not so allowed we, back in the Stop Djokovic and around, George. Weston so, Williams is going to be our judge for these sure five is. rounds. And just from the um, repertoire that these singers cover, it's very clear to see where Nicole Carr is going as a singer. And Yvonne Kenny, uh, you know, focusing a, a lot on Handel and Mozart. We already from the bat can tell you that their voices are are not much alike. Mm. Uh, But the crossover role uh, is Fiordaligi. And that's interesting to me because Fiordaligi can be sung by a voice that's, you know, more creamy, like uh, Kiri Takanawa, but also has been essayed by singers like Edita Gurova, who has a much, you know, more uh, austere, for lack of a better And higher lying, too. Yeah, exactly. Good call. Bad call. 
on Opera Box Score. Good call, bad call. Wrapping up the OBS for you this week. Uh, we're going to start with Oliver Camacho. So two friends of the show will be heard on the next Met broadcast this coming Saturday, or if you're listening to this on Friday, tomorrow. Um, Charles Castronovo and Lucas Meacham <laughs> uh, sing Rodolfo and Marcello, respectively, in the Mets La Boheme. That's a fantastic two guys for a cast. But they also have Maria Gresta as Mimi and Gabriela Reyes. And I think she is the discovery of this cast. Um, she's singing Musetta. She could sing Mimi, no problem. She just appeared in Chicago's production of Florencia and El Amazonas, and she stole the show. So I'm looking forward to seeing how she sounds at the Met. Matt Cummings. You know, I'm always checking Spotify for new classical releases. And this week I found that Sandrine Pio, who has been doing this for like literally almost as long as I have been alive, she's been making recordings, uh, has a new album of uh, Handel Arias called Enchantress that I was listening to getting ready for the show. I think it's Enchantresses. I think it is. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's Enchantresses in French. Okay. <laughs> I, you can read anything in French if you want, you know, it just makes it, depends, it a little bit fancier. Maybe I was just searching for, I only read article <laughs> album reviews in the original languages of the singers. Isn't that the joke that it's like chante and enchanted? And and, never mind. <laughs> it's I a mean, good album. <laughs> it is a good album. She sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm so confused. Weston Williams. Um, my good call this week, uh, I forgot to wear it on the last show, but I did get this lovely Christmas gift. It says, toy, 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 y'all, uh, from the Atlanta <laughs> Opera. And if that ain't me, I don't know what is. Wow. Kudos to Atlanta Opera for doing that. That's pretty swell. I have, well, my first good call is that it's my wife's birthday on uh, oh. January 7th. Oh. Happy birthday. Oh. To her, I have a call call. I don't know if it's a good call or a bad call. Uh, the fam and I on movie night last week, we watched Encanto, which was fine. It's <laughs> not... it it because it you're not... white. I heard all the brown people like it. So Yeah, but very, very wading into that Wading into that Lin-Manuel Miranda discourse with a hot take is George <laughs> Cedarquist. <laughs> the, the, the music is, to me, not that exciting and not necessarily. Here's what I will say is that the piece really is built like a musical. Like it is animated and staged and crafted like a piece of musical theater. And that is mm. kudos to the design team and to the writers and the, the directing staff. The music for me, I did not find that inspiring. So send that hate mail over to ODS. <laughs> that is it for this week's edition of America's Talk Radio Show about Opera. Our announcer, Norm Waddell. He's at normwaddell.com. On Facebook, search for Opera Box Score. Twitter and Instagram, at Opera Box Score. Please help us deepen that bench of listeners by liking and sharing our social media posts. Again, if you're watching on TDO, Dallas Opera Network, you want to make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get the full show. On Stitcher and Spotify, you click follow. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, you hit that plus sign. and Or you can just ask Alexa to play Opera Box Score. Email us those hot takes, operaboxscore at gmail.com. Drop us a line. Send us a voice memo. Get that beer coaster and that lapel pin. Our creative consultant is Oliver Camacho. Our audio and video editor is Weston Williams. For your co-host, Matt Cummings. I'm George Cedarquist asking you to continue the conversation about opera as you sing two long trills connected to a descending scale and arpeggiated scale back up, <laughs> nail a cadential trill and stick the landing. We're back with an all new show next week when we look at the ways in which music highlights epic moments in sports history. Plus you get more opera headlines, more hot takes and more Vegemite. <laughs> oh, join us.